put up Sadiq. And that's it. Yep. At some point, we're going to be joined by Jim Connett. Well, I had the joy of meeting yesterday at the uh, AGF. And, uh, and whatever time she comes, we'll probably pause in the agenda and allow her to take her items. And I don't think we've got anybody else that we're expecting to come. Um, we've got Sarah Collins for item three. And you are there. I haven't met you yet. So nice to meet you. Okay, so sorry. I am just for the benefit of anybody else. I've been here like a week. Um, and I've, I don't actually know anybody at all yet. So I do apologise. It's not a good state to be in, is it? But uh, so you're here for the maternal and the maker service. So you must be the director of midwifery then, right? because I've heard so much about it. That's fantastic. Yes. Thank you so much for me. taking your item early as well. Um, I don't think I'm getting, if you keep seeing me look to my left, I'm getting little notes from Laura. She's guiding me through this meeting. So my next uh, question is, has anybody got any declarations of interest on any items on this agenda? No. If any of you, if something occurs to you during your discussion, if we go off down a little alleyway or something, you think, oops, I've got, a bit, I've got an interest in that, please say it at the time and then we can deal with it in the moment, don't leave it till um, afterwards and say I should have said something. That's much the best way. And if you're not sure, declare it anyway, because it's always the safest way to do it. Okay, so I think we're going to go straight on to our maternity and the services update with Sarah and Karen. Are you going to introduce it, Karen? We're going to um, go and uh, do our presentation. You're going to go and do okay. your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. It has to be back in the room properly, isn't it? It's quite a thing. There's a big screen. <laughs> so, sorry, guys, I'm just going to make you all. So, thank you, everybody. While we're going to the presentation, um, Sarah and I are here to present on the DNA and Services Services up there. But it's in, in two parts, really, today. So, the, the first part is um, reflections on our QPSA that Matt's in the home. September and October, although it was the first of November, just to confuse everybody. We've got that later in the agenda, the chair reports with that, which said that we spent probably an hour and a half um, talking about neonatal services in, um, on the first of November. And, and that was a that was good meeting. Um, there was lots of discussion. Um, Sam Wallace came and, and presented on that. Um, so we are at the moment currently. Part of a rapid quality review, then it is in the name of services. That's transitioning into a, 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 a QID or a quality review. And as part of that, um, specialist commission, commission of services that is named in this, have been to do an assurance for that. And they've just confirmed this week that the day that we will be on the 7th of December. But the next one, you know, after December's UPSA, I'll be able to put your to your airports for that QID visit as well. Can you just lift your voice a little bit? I'm sorry, it's not, like it. it's not like me. No, I, so, I'm struggling to um, hear. So, I'm sorry, apologies. Um, on the back of um, uh, QPSA in November, when we were looking at the volumes of information that came through, it also made us think about how we present the papers in relation to maternity and the NAs, and how we can do that even better. No. We did, we did make a, try, a change probably eight, nine months ago where more things went to um, the academy rather than coming directly to board so that we could focus on the salient points. But actually, and this has been confirmed by, I don't know if anybody saw the, the research that's been published by Sons Thomas over last week. So um, reiterated there when they've said actually that the amount of volume of maternity stuff that goes to boards and in the papers because of mandated things like QIS, what's expected by often, that it's huge in volume. Um, I think somebody used a phrase earlier, you can't see the wood for the trees, and it sometimes feels a bit like that. So um, Sarah and I have had some discussion and reflection on this, and actually we want the board to consider whether or not we do need to look at some sort of task finish group, but on the board, because normally these are things that happen at different levels, but at the board with the exec directors and non-exec directors, where we can look through and say, actually, what does the best maternity in the NFL report look like? How do we get that assurance? So that's one of the aspects of today that we consider that, whether for a time limited period, 
we look at um, <coughs> task finish group that looks at the maternity and neonatal reporting and how we best get assurance from that. I'm now going to hand over to um, uh, Sarah to go through the, the highlights of her report. Um, but just to reiterate, um, a lot, lot of stuff around um, neonatal deaths, um, um, hypoxic brain injuries, IUDs, staffing out the two liver reports, and that's been looked at through QGSA. We do, though, want to make more aware of some work that um, Sarah's getting involved with around uh, maternal suicides, which um, Sarah's going to give some more details on that. So I'll sit down now and I'll let Sarah carry on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, um, as uh, as Karen said, um, the information you have today um, relates to activities occurred within the perinatal service in both August and September that was presented to the uh, uh, respective quality um, quality measure safety families uh, who, in their delegated authority, uh, approved the contents uh, and recommendations that were that were in there. Those papers are always uh, full of a lot of information um, and the appendices are often also full of quite a lot of information. Um, but some of the key things that we pull out there uh, that are regularly reported on are our details of harms, including stillbirths, DNA deaths, and hypoxic brain injuries, um, and any completed investigations that have occurred in that month, um, including the learning that then goes to the Quality Patient Safety Academy and is also one of the appendices that, that you would see as closed board uh, for your information as well. So the main, the main discussion points in um, in August and September, um, and so we discussed the number of cases that we've had with harms. We had one completed internal investigation report that was closed in September, which was discussed, including an update on the progress uh, and on the actions, uh, which was good progress. Um, the PLRT, which is the Perinatal Mortality Review Tool, quarterly report, uh, was also presented, and that is a, a key part of the uh, compliance, uh, compliance requirement for the maternity incentive scheme, and it's presented on a quarterly basis. Um, we're pleased to say that our progress against the standards is, is on, will be diametric, or we are on track to meet it by a sufficient date uh, in February, so in February, so now it rise slightly. Um, we also presented uh, as a regular part, we also always um, give an update on our training compliance, and that was discussed at both academies. October, we're also providing an update on the progress of the three year plan, which I won't dwell on because I'll give you a bit more detailed update there. Um, because there, is, there are some aspects that may need some more than support to achieve as we go forward. We also um, gave a brief summary of the maternal deaths that occurred in the last three years um, and, um, assist, and the fact that we're now pulling out a system wide learning event around maternal suicides, which has been one of the, and when you when you look at three years, the main chunk of deaths have been in relation to maternal suicides. Um, October, and we were also asked to announce another maternity incentive scheme requirement, compliance requirement, uh, which was the uh, quarterly board level report um, regarding the implementation against the new, uh, same things like three year, uh, so three year version three. Um, we, we have um, done a benchmarking exercise on that, um, and that has had some external scrutiny and review from our local maternity and neonatal system um, members, uh, and also some of our ICD representatives. The opinion at the moment is that we are on target to achieve what we need to do to pass uh, to meet the compliance with the maternity incentive scheme, which is good news. That's a huge piece of work. There's lots of things that have been added into it this time around. Um, and service pressures are making it quite difficult to deliver, but we're moving right So that came out at the end of March, and I did give a brief update um, to board in May. Um, so the of the three-year plan was essentially pulling all of those recommendations that have come out of Ockenden and then the Kirkham report uh, together um, in, into one comprehensive um, report, essentially. So a summary of that plan was presented to UTM and then to the board. Uh, we benchmarked it again in September, and that benchmarking again was done with the support of our, uh, our local maternity and neonatal uh, system ahead of our, our, our planned assurance visit, which was last week or week before now, so I was ticking on rapidly. 
which I've got to say, I'm not focused on that, was overwhelmingly positive. Um, we have assurance in it this time last year from the regional team, the LMS have now picked up responsibility for assurance visits and we really didn't have a vast amount in the way of recommendations for them to continue with the great work that we're doing. So that was that was a real boost to everybody um, within the unit. Um, our compliance with the long-standing maternity safety scheme, uh, term safety action will support delivery, delivery and planning many areas. And we are at the moment um, on target to achieve probably nine out of the ten. There's still a little bit of hesitance around one at the moment, but we're hoping that that will, will work once see. There are a number of areas which may, that may prove to be challenging, however, and might require some form of support in the next 12 months. So the first of those has been um, achieving use accreditation, which is around the baby friendly standards um, and is uh, seen as a, as, a, as a gold standard for maternity services to have. Um, our neonatal service do have it, uh, but ours is last, and we are going through that accreditation process at the moment. Um, it might require um, some short term investment potentially into the, into the feeding team to help us to achieve those standards. There's a massive ask that every staff member uh, that deals with that deals with new mums um, has a two-day um, training that is then competency assessed. So at the moment we've got one um, input feeding um, advisor uh, who supports the delivery of that work stream, but it's quite a major ask for one person to do. So it may be that we we need to back that. However, when you did read the three-year plan, it did say that there would be potentially some support offered to those trusts that weren't currently accredited, but as yet we haven't heard what that looks like. Um, progression of burdens, maternity continuity and care teams, and, and our aim is very much that we do have when safe staffing is achieved. And I know this is sometimes a bit of a contentious issue across the, uh, across the regional and the national teams at the moment. We um, haven't got a deadline to achieve anymore, which is takes pressure off a little bit. But our commitment is very much that we continue to focus on providing continuity of care to our most vulnerable women and families. And then that will be the next stage as well. We as soon as we are in a position to, um, to progress further teams, the focus will continue to be women who are either vulnerable because of um, their social situation, whether it's whether there are language challenges, whether the asylum seekers, etc., they will be prioritised uh, even further than they are already. Um, the building blocks are in place for that, and we have got very much trust commitment um, from from uh, the finance uh, from a finance perspective to establish to the to the requirement as and when we achieve safe staffing, which again is I think quite. It's reassuring for me, certainly as a director of delivery. I know that other uh, organisations aren't quite in that position at the moment, so I, I do take great uh, pride in that. Um, the other thing that we uh, are potentially going to need support with is, is, is there's an emphasis on having an equality lead within the service. Now, whilst we've got some equality leads within the organisation, we don't have anybody specifically for maternity, so it's looking at actually is what we've got sufficient and do we just need to be a little bit more... Um, inclusive from a maternity perspective, or do we actually need somebody that's, that, that, that becomes a standalone role? I do have a little bit of a thought on that. There is also a requirement that we, uh, the organisations are um, expected to have a consultant midwife within their structure. That's something we don't have at the moment because we've been prioritising the director head on, deputy, deputy head on roles in the first instance. We're nearly on target with that. That was the next consideration. So I wonder whether this is something that we can pull together and actually have an equality lead uh, as a consultant midwife who focuses very much on public health and reducing inequalities. So that's potentially the direction of travel, but would need some support for that. The other challenge um, that potentially we'll have is the development of an in-house equality dashboard and an improvement plan based on the findings. So obviously that's something that we're going to need to work really closely with our BI and digital colleagues and our digital midwife uh, to support that, uh, that progress. Um, and then NMVP involvement in co-production of services. We had a very well-established MMVP group. We have had some challenges over the last 12 months as their, as their um, leadership's changed. It is coming back on track now, and I'm really confident that we'll be able to work closely with them going forwards. Um, we do have some challenges with the, with, the, with the resource, but that is being looked at and there's meetings happening um, with our ICB colleagues to try and, and actually get that um, sorted out. Um, 
we're discussing that again this month, and we are also awaiting some very well welcomed uh, revised national guidance. So, since the MNBPs, so that's maternity, maternity and neonatal voice capture, sorry for those people that, uh, that don't know, um, since they started a few years ago, the demand on them as a result of Ockenden recommendations and national guidance has just gone absolutely through the roof. Um, which hasn't really been reflected in the um, in the in the support that's provided to enable them to uh, to do the role. So that's been looked at really closely. So I can pause there on the three year plan. Anyone who's got any specific questions, or move straight on and ask at the end. Okay. You know, keep going. Okay. Then we'll, we'll take it in the round. You've got stuff okay. Okay. So as we uh, we we also presented to quality academy last month, obviously uh, early this month now. Um, we just wanted to bring the fact that we um, a little bit of information about the maternal death that we've had in the 2020-2023 period, which is sort of in line with the, the most recent Embrace report that came out a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, so just a really brief summary. We had four antenatal deaths, um, one, one of which was an, an inpatient and one, and one woman that was nearly pregnant and not booked. We've had five postnatal deaths. Um, ranging from five weeks postnatal to seven months. And then the key bit there is that four of those postnatal, postnatal deaths were suicides, um, in addition to which we'd also have an, a, an attempted suicide. And um, our neighbours, Airdale, have also had a return death from suicide in the same patch. So actually, we are a bit of an outlier in this area, or so it feels, that even though we're talking very, very small numbers, it still feels that that's far more than anywhere else um, are reporting, certainly in the region, but not nationally. We know that this is one of the leading causes of death in the postnatal period for the year. We looked at ethnicity um, and, our, and it's consistent with the Embrace report um, that women from a global majority are more likely to die. Um, the breakdown of the women that we sadly lost two were white British, two black African, two South Asian and three Eastern European women. So whilst I've signed those at the moment, it's sort of a statement. It's what do we do next is the is the, is the next thing that we, that we need to be really looking at. Um, all of those reports, um, all, all, the, all of those deaths were reported to Embrace UK, which is the national reporting system. Four of them were the health would were referred to the um, health safety investigation branch, which just to confuse everybody now has now changed the maternity and neonatal safety investigations um, that will be um, under the umbrella of the CQC. Um, so four of them were, were reviewed independently by that by that group, but the all of those cases had a multidisciplinary team review um, from from uh, my maternity team. Four of the cases that occurred in the postnatal period were picked up by the Care Trust. So there the serious investigation reporting bits sat with them rather than with us. But again, we did a thorough, a thorough MDT review of the cases um, as far as the maternity access was concerned. And then there was one case that the joint um, Care Trust and, and us assigned. So just to pull it together, the summary is really were obviously the increase in maternal suicide we've noted. Um, the number, there were a number of these cases that are subject to domestic homicide reviews at the moment. So we were really keen that even though these have happened in the postnatal period and were sort of almost outside of our ability to influence and support and to make changes, we feel really strongly that we still need to escalate that and look at what can we do, what can we do to communicate better once these women have left maternity care. However, the Home Office, because of the domestic homicide review, the Home Office apparently are quite reluctant for us to do a separate thematic review on them at the moment. So we've had a, a really brief system, uh, system meeting, and what we've agreed at the moment is that we are looking to plan a, a learning event for early next year to look at um, ways that we better identify those women that are really at risk in the postnatal period of taking their own lives. And what we found from our bit of analysis is that that is particularly where there's a removal of the baby or significant safeguarding um, issues. So um, I'm working very closely with, um, with members at the Care Trust, um, but also in public health 
um, and the, uh, I, can't, I, mean, I can't recall the name, but one of the key people that's working on suicide prevention at the moment at system level is supporting me by looking for some funding to actually get this together and off the ground. Um, and we're hoping that that will be really productive and be able to come out with some really key objectives that we can, we can start to take forward. So finally, as we end now, so the request for November laws is um, to prove that you're sure that that quantitative safety can have reviewed and discussed the contents of the August and September papers um, as a committee of the board um, delegated authority, and that refers to appendices number one and two. To also prove that you're assured again that PSA have reviewed the PMRT also reports, which we require for compliance with that you have noted the appendices three and four, which describe the, the hands, including the stillbirth, HIEs, and neonatal deaths, um, and equally any new uh, and ongoing investigations. And then also to acknowledge that there is a um, completed um, internal incident report regarding um, a case um, and the learning there that's also bring our attention. And then finally, progress to, to note the progress on the on the um, delivery of the three year plan and the fact that we are going to be um, doing the system wide learning, focusing on the terms for the sound. I think that's it for me. So, do you require any further information? Is my first ask. Yeah. Uh, do you have any concerns? And are you sure by the information presented? So thank you very much, Sarah, for, um, for giving us all that information, all the information that's in the file, um, and I think for bringing out the sort of key points that you really want us to focus on. Um, there are some, there were some specifics in there around board support, and once I've done a round of questions, I'd like to just to understand what do you mean by board support, um, and and then we can direct that in the appropriate in the appropriate way. Um, but I'll, I'm going to turn first to my I'm going to turn first to my QPSA chairs, if that's okay, just to um, just to confirm in terms of their um, you know that you've had all of this information and the level of assurance, and then I'll open it to questions if that's okay. So I don't know, Louise, you've come off mute, so I'll let you go first. Yeah, thank you very much, Helen. Yes, so Mohammed and I in the past few meetings, Sarah always produces. As we've discussed before a very comprehensive bundle of papers for us to go through all the things that have been raised by sarah have come through the academy as as she has described and um and we have taken uh, assurance from those things and we also note the the things for the board support and that glad that they've come today for discussion I don't know if mohammed you wanted to add to that um, yeah, good couple of reflections and thoughts. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, I would agree that um, I think Sarah's always brings a lot of information to QPSA and is always kind of generous with questioning and, and, and providing that feedback. So I really welcome that. Um, I think we've had some discussion, haven't we, Louise, about with the level of focus on maternity and neonate, you know, would it be of value to have a separate discussion outside of QPSA to give it the additional time perhaps that we need because we're constrained by just the time and the agenda with everything else that QPSA needs to do and we're giving some consideration to that. I would add that um, we had a, a deep dive into kind of neonate from and the issues that kind of Helen referred to at the outset in terms of her introduction uh, that were out in the public domain and we spent some considerable time looking at that and we, we took a significant amount of additional assurance from that. Um, so some matters we've discussed outside of committee, and that's perfectly valid and perfectly okay. And Sarah, there's a couple of things I wanted to perhaps just draw together, and and probably take your view on as well. Would be that, um, and I think you and I have shared a common interest and a, and a continued focus on ethnicity translation, health health inequalities. And I'm really pleased that you've highlighted it once again. I have found that I think that we perhaps still have a lot more work to do, and there's perhaps something. In terms of perhaps a possible answer back to the chair or what could the board do to support you more i think the board could do more in that respect um perhaps highlighting those challenges highlighting some actions to to address i would draw it at a higher level as well and say that more widely than just maternity i think there is further work we need to do around health inequalities ethnicity translation i know you have yourself sarah in the past brought to us the challenges around access to translation the app and it's available, it's not available, problems. Uh, good, I'm pleased. 
Um, it was one of the questions I was going to ask, so that's really helpful to know that it's available. The loan, the loan working devices. There's definitely more work we need to do there, but it needs to be beyond maternity. It's like a board level, organisation wide approach. Um, and that's something I think we, you and I have, have discussed before. My final point before I do shut up uh, would just be around how we draw together what you've presented to us here now in this part of the agenda, together with the midwifery staffing paper we have later. And then in the high level risks, we've got risk 3404, which is one of our longest standing risks with 11 changes to its target mitigation date. I couldn't quite draw it all together, if I'm being honest. I looked at these different things. They're all really useful, lots of valuable information. But then I struggled to stitch them all together into a comprehensive kind of view. Could you help me with that? <clears throat> OK, so I'm in terms of really, really useful questions. I'm going to just uh, I want to take the equality question as a sort of separate, separate one, if that's OK, because I think we've got a specific around equality leading in terms of which we'll come back to. And there's a more generic point around uh, equality for the world that we can wrap up at the end. Um, I'll give you a little bit of time to think about the connection of the um, the risk with the safer staffing, with the, you know, because I think it's a valid sort of question. So I'll give you a little bit of time to sort of think think about that. But I guess what I wanted from that was just some confirmation, I think, from the QPSA, um, you know, that, of that level of endorsement. And then we'll pick up the, the questions that follow, if that's OK. So we're going to open up for other questions as well, so that we can sort of then take them all in the round. So um, uh, Karen, then Julie, uh, then Sugra, then John. Thanks, Helen. <clears throat> Great presentation, Sarah. Thank you. Always really, really clear, uh, even if we've got issues with reporting and uh, uh, other data. And just a quick suggestion on reporting for everybody, actually, in all uh, areas is my guidance would always be simple but strong, less but not weaker, uh, if that helps, uh, just as a, as a header. Um, I think in the three year plan, the emphasis on the equality lead within the service is a great suggestion. And I really liked your uh, the, the thinking about incorporating it into your consultant midwife role because finances are under pressure, as everybody knows right now. And I think the more creative and innovative we can be to combine those roles is, is key. Um, equality is everybody's business and responsibility. So tagging it into leadership roles is great because then uh, you know you've got you've got a north star for that kind of thing. Um, just bearing in mind uh, the slide that you talked about, the deaths, uh, maternal deaths and the Embrace report and the global majority. Um, there are three Eastern Europeans involved in that and there is a growing population of Eastern Europeans in Bradford. Um, so my plea would be that we talk equality in the round, not just ethnic background, black. Um, we need to consider the whole population of Bradford and make sure that whatever we do in that equality lead, is, is capable of dealing with all populations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, first of all, a comment, heartbreaking about the maternal suicides. Didn't kind of realise those numbers, heartbreaking, really interested in kind of where we get to with those and what we can do, even if they weren't in our case, kind of, it's heartbreaking, isn't it, to listen to Sunday, having a baby and then going through that. So that's just a comment. Second one is the number of harms. So we talked about discussing the number of harms, where do we get to? Is there anything as a board we should be worried about? And then my last question is just about the things you put up about board support for and some of those requiring additional investment. It might be a question to Matthew, really. How are we going to manage all of that? Because we can sit here and say they're fantastic ideas. And I've no doubt that every service that comes and talks to us will come up with some fantastic ideas. So a little bit of understanding it, even if we do support them, how are we going to prioritise them, given the financial position? OK, so I'm, I'm letting you sort of hold these questions in. <laughs> and I'll, so and then I'm making a note in terms of some things we need to come back to. So if you do you want to respond to the. Um, what you say? The number of pounds, the number of pounds. Do you want to respond to that point? <coughs> back to the resource and the asks. So I guess the number of harms is there's a, there's a standard we, we bring them on a on that regular basis, and and the key ones for us obviously are around the number of stillbirths that we have and the um and the number of pregnancy um, brain injuries are probably the key ones for us. Um, 
What we tend to do is look is that information is coming on a monthly basis to quality patient safety. We had to we're, we're, we're still following that process of where we think we have a spine more than we would expect in a month. We are reviewing those thematically, so we're continuing with those with those processes. And actually, at this moment in time, there, there's no specific themes or trends that are emerging, but that's something that we are always looking at. We are pushing on this that that slight that, that bit further now to to look at it from an ethnicity perspective as well, um, and and as I sort of mentioned there, I think the development of a um, of an equality dashboard will really help with that in to visualise it and will a, will enable us. I'm sort of answering multiple questions. One here, really, aren't I? Will enable us to then target some of our key populations. Okay, community rather within our within our um, population, so that we can look at actually is it an Eastern European? Do we need to do some focused work in in a Roma community, for example? Do we need to do some focused work in our um, in, in one of our African communities? There's lots of bits and pieces. Because at the moment, we're involved in loads of bits, but it's how to draw it all together and keep a handle on it. So I yeah. think that that dashboard will really help to support that. So yeah. that would be something obviously that we're appealing to Paul and his team for that support with to get that up and running as as a priority. Um, so we, so everything has been looked at. Yeah. There's nothing emerging. We yeah. did do a deep dive into our um, hypoxic brain injuries in. I think it will come in the next page because we, we did it, we had a round table review of them in late October. So it will feature in the next paper paper comes to quality academy. I mean, this is the difficulty in the renewable style each time. We have identified that we're an outline with my foster brain injuries. We're not sure whether part of that is that we again have a lower, slightly lower tolerance to cooling some babies than other units do, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It, doesn't, it shouldn't all be used badly. Um, we also looked, we've also picked out that there were a few cases that were avoidable. So they're the ones that we now are taking forward to look at what can we do differently. For the ones that were avoidable, what could we have done differently? And is that is that something that could happen today, tomorrow, all of those things. So everything is really being looked at carefully and we're trying to find other solutions as well as just trying to maintain that day-to-day -day safe service, which is a massive challenge at the moment. And and you know. We, we are in a, a, a very difficult position at the minute. It's not just driven by staffing. So going on to the Hamid point, some of, some of the challenges we're facing isn't just a staffing issue. It's partly because we, in the, in the attempt to reduce harms at national level, more and more interventions or things are being suggested. So whether that's additional scanning for women who are at risk of um, and, you know, small babies, whether it is for inducing a woman bang on term if she has got reduced people movement instead of watching and waiting. It struck me, we were doing we're currently running a point of care testing. Um, and so we are picking up more women who are struck me positive when they're coming in labour. What that means is their baby, they, they, both they and their baby, Need a longer length of stay because they then need IV antibiotics. So we're having flow challenges because essentially we're putting all these things into keep people safe in a service that can't doesn't have the capacity. Actually, even as far as beds are concerned, so we are in a really difficult position at the moment. We have induction backlogs that we're trying to manage carefully and safely. We're not an outlier. We know that we're in a rough ride at the moment. But we know equally that our other organisations are. So I'm involved with a piece of work. At, at regional level in early December to look at induction processes. We're, we're at everything we need to be to look at what can we do differently. Um, but staffing is only a small part of it. And I think we're going to go to that. Does that answer most it did, of it did, it thank you. It yes. was, it's adverse discussion. Was there anything to worry about? And, you, and, and it was a really strong thing. Yeah. You. So we'll, we'll come back to, to the, the point of connecting the wrist if it's okay. I'm going to go to Supra, then okay. Don, and then Mel, and then we'll draw this. Oh, uh, thanks, Sarah. Um, I think I, I've joined the rest of the board in welcoming the discussion uh, around the, the introduction of the equality lead role, whatever shape that takes. Um, and I think that that's one of the opportunities for the board um, to feed in um, so that we capture some of the lessons learned over the past few months and from some of the incidents. Um, I think you said the work with the Maternity Voices Partnership is very much still working. 
progress, isn't it? Um, and one of the things I've been keen to see is to make sure that that organisation has got the capacity and is also both reflective and representative of the, the broader community. Um, so we'll wait and see what happens in, in the refreshed version of that. Um, you've invited us to comment on um, areas that we might want to have further information. So one of them was around the culture leadership programme. And some of that work has been informed by a survey which had a response rate of 41%. So I just wanted to check with you the degree of confidence that you've got that the themes that we're pulling out are representative of the whole staff group. Um, and then I wondered whether you want to say anything more about the management of gestational diabetes, because that's come up um, as something that needs to be discussed at the Champions meeting, et cetera. And then lastly, just something on training competencies and blood transfusion because of the history that we've had around transfusion management and whether there's anything further we could do um, to, to bring that compliance up. Okay, so I don't, do, you want, do you want to take those two points? Although I, I guess I would probably think that much of that will get discussed in the QPSA, um, but for the benefit of the board, if you can answer if you yeah, can find those points more detail. So the 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 blood transfusion issue is actually a uh, it's it's not a maternity specific challenge. It's a, an organisational one. I think we even are struggling with the number of key trainers that we have within the, within the organisation to actually deliver that to deliver that training. So that's an ongoing. So what we're trying to do at the moment is is encourage. More, more midwives to all take the train the trainer approach so that we can deliver it. So that's how we're trying to tackle that at the moment. Um, we do, whilst we do get quite a lot of blood transfusion or transfusion day texts, they tend to be in relation to mislabeling samples and things like that that require a reread rather than it. So the, I know the potential for harm, but the low harm. So I think the the issue that we had previously with transfusion uh, and was a neonatal SI, but that again was related to mostly from a transfusion side rather than from a from a clinical service side, if that, if that makes sense. But our way around of trying to improve um, our compliance with training is to, to do more in the train, 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 train the goals. Um, so I don't know whether there is any specific support that we can sort of get for that. It's a really difficult one. Again, it's that. What's the mitigation? So, yeah, these so people that are given blood transfusions have had training, but it's mandated that that training which is a refresh. So what we're talking about is people having a refresher training. So nobody would give blood. Who have not been trained to give blood, and I would suggest that blood gets given reasonably <laughs> regularly. In, 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 in some other wards, they might give blood on separate breast and gill um, every 20 years. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do you want to pick up um, the other points from? So you asked about gestational, the work from gestational diabetes. Yeah. Um, diabetes. Um, we have a big, as you're aware, we have a, a, a huge cohort of women who um, who develop gestational diabetes during their pregnancy. Put a lot of things in place to try and um, make sure that we are um, meeting nice guidance, that we are compliant with the scanning regimes, all of those kind of things, and it is one of the key work stream still within the outstanding terms of uh, service uh, program mm -hmm. which obviously is now business as usual for us so it's still something that is very much on our radar but again i think it's got so many complexities attached to it that there's no sort of quick fix to make it perfect overnight it's still requiring an, an awful lot of um an awful lot of input because uh, uh, unless it was the one specific aspect of it that you were concerned about at the, at the moment. So just in terms of, is there anything from a board point of view that we could do to support them? So, so again, I think some, we're sort of trying to think outside the box a little bit in the sense that can we start, you, can we, can we're looking at, can we put some resources into actually having some services going out of loop rather than everything from BRI, for example. So that also helps with the inequality yeah. side of things as well. But actually, it's looking at things like that. Can we put things that are closer to women that will encourage them to attend? Because one of the challenges that we do have is 
we get quite a few women who don't attend for their for their GTT, their gestational, you know, the, the test to de determine whether they've got gestational diabetes. So actually, do we need to be do we need to be going closer to people to actually try to improve that? There's also a piece of work that we need to do with our diabetic colleagues as well, I've got to say. So it's probably a much broad conversation that may need bringing out somewhere else, and that's probably a main conversation further down the line. But actually, it's massive. And again, they're in a service that are quite small and, and actually a couple of capacity perspective, because obviously these people that develop the gestational diabetes do need the input from a endocrinologist as well as from a um, as well as from maternity service as well so I think that it's a, it is a huge piece of work but the only assurance I can give you at the minute is that it's still very much a priority piece of work that we that we're trying to address. Okay and I think your final point was around the co-production with the advice partnership which you will pick up as part of the board support. Yeah, it was just the morning and that culture and leadership programme yeah, and whether really well, the confidence that's being set up has been picked up through the service. Yeah, so um, because we're reliant on an external company at the moment to actually give us the guidance to to, to deliver the, um, to, to actually do the analysis, we're still making that at the moment. Um, the initial feedback did look reflective of what we already know, though, so about grassroots information. We've had a really good push, I don't know if we're playing more. Give, a, we'll give us a, a brownie point for this. I've had a really good push on the um, on the staff survey this time, so it will be interesting to see how we do there and, and actually triangulate that against what we've got from the score survey as well. Um, so to, to look at actually, is there anything else that we're missing? Um, we're also obviously incorporating the maternity, the patient maternity survey, survey into that feedback as well. To look at actually, we think we're doing this. You think we're doing that, that, but the women think we're doing the other. So we're actually trying to pull all of those things together. So that's how we will be approaching it. But we've also got co-production with the NMVP to actually look at the any subsequent action or but I'd rather call it an improvement plan now um, to, to how we address some of those challenges. Incredible. Thank you. Uh, John? Thank you very much. Uh... Two comments, Sarah. Uh, two questions. I'll email you on some specifics later to save time. First of all, just answer the question. I am assured. I think it was an excellent transparent report. So well done for that. Uh, I think that was um, very useful. So thank you. I'm fully supportive of the EDI stuff, and I'll agree entirely what Karen said. So I won't bore you with that detail. But yeah, we've got to save some time. My two questions are: on the suicide stuff, are you able to, or are you planning to pick up issues around mental health and neurodiversity, particularly given the nature of the communities and possibilities of being masked or undiagnosed? That's the first question. I assume there are some issues there. And um, the second question relates to our garbled conversation in the corridor this morning about the CQC announcement today and whether that's going to present further challenges around staff morale and public confidence. And if it is, what are we going to do about it? Yeah. Ooh, that was quite good. I didn't even lie down at all. So yeah, we, which one are we going with first there? Um, just repeat the second the first question there, John. The first question was the mental health. The mental health and the your asking it really. Yeah. So from what we know, so, so from the from the maternal suit side, we knew that th at least three out of four deaths, we knew that those women had 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 mental health challenges that we already knew about, and that they had already had a lot of um care and uh, support with during pregnancy and what we felt to be a robust handover to to the next service um so no, i'm not diminishing any responsibility there but we we, we looked and we, we've identified the right people you know we we did the right thing for those women when they were under our care what needs to be strengthened i think is how we support our uh, the, the wider system including social so, you know children's social care into how they can potentially red flag women who are, yeah. I don't know, coming to have a visit with a baby that's been removed, for example, yeah. and, and, and do a bit of promotion there. We have got a perinatal mental health um, lead midwife who has a, a massive caseload. She doesn't manage the caseload as, uh, on an individual basis, but she has got, she tries to encompass our most significant mental health um, cases that come through maternity, and there are lots. Neurodiversity is also another one that is starting to, to creep in in a um, 
in a, in a much more frequent uh, on a more frequent basis as well. So that is something that again that we possibly need to put some additional training in because it's separating the two. Other people have got unique yeah. unique needs there, but we do have a fo- we do have a focus there. And actually, my next view would be that we once we have got to say staffing, that actually a focus continuity team on mental health is probably where we need to go next yeah. in, in Bradford. Um, so so. It, again, it's something that I guess is very much on our radar, but actually we would like to take that take that that next step further and actually do more for those uh, for those women and families experiencing that. And then the general morale point, I guess. That yeah, um, I won't make any further. I shouted at the radio this morning. You know, shouted at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I just shouted at the, uh, the radio this morning because it was really, it was really quite frustrating um, because it didn't it was poor journalism in my view again it didn't give that balance so it's it, it's all well and good isn't it for people to shout and say terms of services are rubbish and then for the general public to come in and say well you've got a rubbish service but not give any context and actually that that bit about we're putting further investment into more training that's great that's really well needed much needed and, and we are absolutely on board with that and everything we can do to encourage more people um, to, to come and be a midwife but that doesn't help us in the here and now that's four years away so what we need at the national level what, what i feel i need is is more of what do we do now what can we do what can we stop doing safely now that's got national support and but from a morale perspective, we just have to keep going out round and saying to people, okay, do you remember when the insurance team came around last week? Think about that feedback because they're the people that are looking and they're seeing what we're doing and and they are recognising that we are making improvements. So we've got a long way to go yet, we absolutely know that, but that we are continuing to improve and sustain what we are improving as well. So I think we've just got to, as leaders, keep reinforcing that Um you're doing a great job in some really, really challenging times at the moment. And that's probably, you know, from a board perspective, you know, being able to continually reinforce that care and support of the people we've got working in these services at the moment and trying to overcompensate sometimes for what they hear nationally um, so we don't add to it. So a final comment from Mel, then I'm going to pull this together. Um, thanks, Ira, uh, as always, for your um, excellent presentation. Um, I just wanted to uh, flag the uh, work that you alluded to uh, on a multi-agency basis in respect of the maternal deaths and particular suicides, which is really, really tragic and stark. Uh, and it therefore commands a wholesale approach, I think, to understanding the drivers of that. I was alerted to uh, some changes that are being brought about in respect of the removal of babies into care that had previously uh, I think, made a, a very traumatic situation. The practice had made a very traumatic situation, potentially even more traumatic than perhaps it needed to be. And that needed to uh, involve local authorities, the Children's Trust, and I know that there's a workshop coming up uh, on the 4th of December to look at how we as a system, through the Children's Improvement Board, can do a lot more to alleviate the need to take quite so many babies into care in Bradford as we do. There are certainly patterns emerging where there are multiple pregnancies that result in the same outcome. So there is due to be a real opportunity to reduce that. And uh, just to flag that at the Improvement Board colleagues, um, we're commending our participation in those conversations um, very strongly. And then the second one is I really welcome the concentrated efforts around the inequalities. Um, I think we all acknowledge that we, uh, not just as an organisation, but as a, a place across Bradford District and Crown, have to do much more in this space. And if I were to say anything about um, what we as a, boot, a board could do more, is to think about how we connect with what is happening at place um, through the 1001 as part of the children and families priority um, and I know that that is happening but I just wondered whether you could just say maybe a couple of words that demonstrate how we're contributing to that. And um, so from the from the 
best 1001 days are on it. Yeah. We do have, uh, we do have senior representation and indeed have people who are leading some of the work streams. Um, within that, within that work, within that arm of the um, of the Active One program, um, and yeah, again, we we we're trying to look at every opportunity that we can to. And certainly, this is where we're looking with the NMVP element of it as well. And actually, we know that there are some things that the NMVP absolutely have to do for us as a place. Um, to make to help to meet the incentive scheme, but actually, I think what we're beginning to recognise more is that they can do actually utilise the NMVP more to do those broader engagement pieces of work with our communities to reduce inequalities. That's something that we can do much better as a system. So those conversations are happening. We are looking at you know not small resource, but actually how can we maximise it? So we're very much uh, we're very much involved in those conversations. And I, and I think taking kind of the other thing for me is it's using other bits of grassroots information to actually you hear something. So you've you know, done your reach out though, haven't you? I've done my reach out. Did you do your reach out? Yeah, the reach out was great. And I mean for, for those people who don't know, we've had a year long collaboration now with Grab Metropolitan Food Bank. But to the point now that that's absolutely opened another door is now an approach yesterday by some of you who's heard the feedback from the Metropolitan Food food Bank to say um did did I want some support for helping people with, with fuel who have got fuel poverty? Yes, please. So actually, it's opening more doors. So it was great. It was an absolutely great opportunity to actually see what they're doing. But actually, it's, it's going to be some more connections, um, which I think is another thing. But it's having that ability to be able to go out and do uh, that, that that kind of thing, isn't it? Why are you trying to stop the place from burning down at the same time? Okay, thank you. Uh, Just to pick up on Julie's point, maybe yeah. to debate, because I asked around the funding arrangements for any future investments. Maybe it's a matter of rising the could pick up for F and P Academy and have a debate around how we consider yeah. future yeah. investment opportunities because we've already heard from maternity, we've got so many specialties in the organisation that have <coughs> equally risk um, based needs. So we're just gonna take it all around, but we can pick it up there. So I was gonna bat it back to the exec. So <laughs> I was gonna suggest that as an executive, I think you need to you know, you need to be able to draw these things together, these asks in terms of, and then perhaps you go to F and P, and then when if there's any diversion from that, you bring you bring it through the board. That would have been. I probably should have said that anything that goes to F and P is already discussed at ETM. Yeah, yeah, anyway. yeah. 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 Which, which you would expect, wouldn't you? So, um, do you want to just pick up that final point about the connection between the safer staffing, the risk register, and the and the this report? Between you, either of you, I'm looking at Karen because I so, think Karen's going to. Yeah, um, I, I think you're right, and that, that that happens in a lot of our papers. <laughs> we report bits in different places, don't we? So um, I think there is. You said the number must be the maternity system. Yes. The is yes. the one that you're referring to. Um, the same staffing review is part of the six monthly review that we do as well, and then we've got the stuff that's in this paper. Now we do touch on staffing in the bundle of maternity papers to draw that together. We don't always put the risk in, I don't think, and maybe we should, so good point. So the maternity staffing risk, yes, has been there a long time, and I think it's because it's moved. So what happens is it's cyclical. So if there's a national shortage of midwives, there's a national shortage of nurses, and it's cyclical, and we just think that we're going to get to the right place, and then the pandemic hits. We just think we get to the right place, and then everybody leaves after the pandemic. So um, we have had a number of new midwives started. We've started with some international recruitments as well, which is helpful, um, but probably not having the impact as international nursing recruitment would have. So that's the risk in its entirety. And, and the risk of that is we the mitigate on a daily basis um, is more around one-to-one -one care and labour, um, not being able to give the the best possible experience that we would want to get. If we then go to, um, so that's the rest of it. So if we then look at the safe staffing review, that in its full detail, and I believe this went to, and it went to um, people, um, talks about the red flags in the terms of, um, what we need to do about those and what those red flags are for. Now, commonly the red flags will be around one to one home, labor, delayed drug administration, or delayed pain relief. I would think at the top three. Now, 
those red flags and risks in that fair staffing report and are at the link to the risk that's on the risk register because that's saying that we know these things may well happen, we'll do our best to mitigate it. So that's the next bit. Then we're on a link to it too now. <laughs> this report. So to this report, so we do, like I said, we do think of on staffing. We probably don't call it the risk in the same way. That's something we can do. We may be able to triangulate it better. And I think that leads me back to the very first point I made, which is, I think it would be really useful. So I think my ask of the board, and our ask of the board in reflection, and I think the Hamid and the lead have talked about this as well as, um, and I'm not sure if it's a separate committee of the board or whether it's a short and sort of task finish group, just to look at, actually, how do we get to a point where we receive the assurance at the right time in the right place that makes sense, we can see the wood for the trees or the trees for the wood, and we also manage to make sure that we're compliant with MIS or and everything else. And that's that's like doing a Rubik's cube. It, it, so, you know, super hard to so do it. It's not it's not easy. So I think my ultimate um, ask, and it would also be <coughs> part of the triangulation is can can board can we look at something that is that task finish group? I think we look at the help. So I think so. Obviously, we've got that from the two uh, QPSA chairs, and I think you made the argument well. And actually, as you were responding to people's questions about quality data, quality data, you were reinforcing that argument that we need both better information, but also be able to look at the whole. So it is very overwhelming. There are lots of asks upon maternity services in terms of report this, report that, report the other. I think we do sometimes lose the connection between the reports because I think we get into a position where, um, you know, we, we, we're answering one set of questions and then it raises another. So I, I personally, and, and I'm seeing nods around the table, I think there would be support for establishing perhaps a time limited task and finish group of some description to really bottom out the reporting to the board. I think it would also free up a bit the QPSA, who seem to be very much focusing on maternity and spending a lot of their time on maternity. And, you know, you raised points, for example, around blood transfusions. Yes, it's in maternity, but actually it's in a whole organisation. So actually that enables the QPSA to, to sort of not stop getting drawn down into just solving the maternity issue, but actually to focus in on the things that are showing in maternity, but actually are relevant to the whole. So I think that would probably help that debate, and maybe that's where that sort of thing needs to go. Um, there were some sort of board support things around commitments to recruiting right number of midwives. Oh, no, I'm sure we don't support that. We <laughs> should support that. Um, it's, it's very easy said, but they are done. Um, funding around the infant feeding team, which I think needs to be a part of an exact discussion and then goes into some broader prioritisation. There was a piece around digital and BI support and equality dashboard, which I think feeds into the task and finish group. And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure Paul will support that task and finish group and enable it to be able to support it with the right information in terms of, you know, tidying up some of its reporting and it was nodding that will do. Um, there's a way to participate in the task and finish group. The they are the possible. Is actions, that's fine. Yeah. Then there's the piece around co production that I think I, you ask us to support that. It sounds like this is something beyond our walls, and this is something that perhaps in your different relationships with partners, that there's a, an endorsement. Now, if there's a comeback, for, can you fund it, please? I think that may need to feed into the funding conversations that the exec have. And then I think the final and biggest point I think made in here is around equality and um, and really uh, finessing, I think, our approach to equality. And I think great start around the equality lead maternity. I think you have to decide whether you incorporate it or you put a bid in for another role. That's your job, isn't it? You know, it's not our job to say which of those two things you need to do. You know your service the best. You know what will deliver you the best outcomes. And again, I, what I would suggest is that that maybe if you, if you if you need a bit of endorsement for that, you take it into the exec, because that's an operational issue. Would we as a board support you putting some emphasis on equality in within a cost we would? Nobody's around the interest of rule, no, I don't think we should do that. And then I think that Mohammed makes a bigger point, which I think we could perhaps pick up in our board planner. Um, around equality per se and where we are. So I met with the 
uh, equality team yesterday at the AGN. Um, and they were showing me all the stuff they're doing and they're going down for a nursing times award. So that's it. There's a lot of stuff going on in that space. Let's let's see it here. Let's all feel actually that you know this is this is a really important part of what we're of what we're doing here. And and we can have a debate here around our overall strategy around equality and whether or not we're confident and com you know and comfortable with it as a board. Because there's obviously a lot of activity. But perhaps we're not as well sighted on it at the board as we could be. So, in terms of your um, specific recommendations, a couple of these are obviously they're in the closed board because of the confidential nature of them, which is absolutely fine. Um, I'm taking that the rest of the board are content to support these recommendations. I'm not going to re read them out because I'll get even more behind from our already. Um, I think you've given a really, you know, a really good sort of comprehensive account. Thank you very much for doing that. I know that this is, it, it's so big that every board in the land is having very detailed conversations in, the, in this. And I know that can be very frustrating for those of you who just want to get on and do the work. Um, unfortunately, it's just how it is at the moment. <laughs> um, but thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, I know we've got a bit behind. I hope you feel that we gave that enough time, though, um, in order to do it justice, given how it's significant it is. So, thank you very much. Okay. So, I'll now rely on you to help me catch it a little bit. Okay, thank you very much. Right, we're now, we've got um, a couple of sets of minutes um on the on the agenda um so the first set of minutes is from your last meeting on the 21st of september now i'm going to just ask you if those of you who were present and um, can confirm if these are a correct account of that meeting and if you have any amendments i am not going to go through the page by page if that's how you normally do it because it will take too long so has anybody got any amendments no, so you're happy to accept these as a correct record of your meeting on the 21st. Okay. There is an action plan on the back of this meeting before I come on to the matter of the 20th of January. So in terms of that action plan, um, a number of these were actioned out for today and there is comment in terms of these along the right hand side um, because I've not been in and around the organisation I, I, I wouldn't know how far these have or haven't progressed so I'm going to just offer out to you or uh, uh, to Laura to perhaps update us on anything that we need to flag here because it's slipping and it matters if it's slipping and it doesn't matter as much that's okay so is there anything we need to highlight on this action plan that we need to be concerned about because of its slipping John that um, there was one thing I just wanted to check with the board. So in terms of the first action around the session yep. relating to communication with patients, um, I think this came on the back of a patient story that we received and some feedback um, that communication, you know, maybe wasn't as, as clear as it could have been. But I suppose it was just to check if the board still would still want that session to be arranged with um, governors uh, and non-executive colleagues. Uh, and, and you know, if so, uh, then I'll work with Karen to okay. that. So, getting, yeah, getting a few endorsements. Yeah, it came up at the um, Council of Governors as well as a, as a topic of interest. So, yeah. yeah, I think they connected it to discharge planning at the Council of Governors. So, maybe we could incorporate both. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. If there's nothing else on there, I just want to turn to one other item. So, um, in your minutes of the 20th of January 2022, and I know it's a long time ago, and I don't expect any of you to remember this in detail, but there was an error in those minutes that subsequently ended up being an error in other documents because it got transposed into other things. And we need to take this time just to correct this error and to then therefore prevent it getting reported wrongly in other papers. So you will see it was highlighted on the one that you were sent, um, and that is the correction of three to two um, in terms of the club of I don't even know how you say that. Club CL are out there. So are you content with the amendment to these minutes for those of you who were there? Yeah, 
So that now corrects those very old minutes, but nevertheless corrects them. Right, that's good. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll move on now to um, Mel's report. Uh, thank you, Chair. And in the interest of time, um, I'm happy to take questions if we can take the paper as read. There's just one area specifically that I wanted to highlight, yeah. which relates to the first of our four P's, patients and operational activity. Um, uh, it is a specific letter communication received on the 8th of November uh, from a number of uh, senior leaders at NHS England in respect of um, a request to um, recalibrate our operational and financial plans to recognise the additional funds that have been made available in response to the impact of the industrial action that we have seen over a significant number of months now. So at a national level, there is a, a, a calculation that the cost of addressing the impact of the industrial action, of which there have been 40 days to date, which <laughs> to the end of October is in the order of about a billion pounds. So in order to address that financial pressure that has been felt by all providers, an additional 800 million has been made available. Um, and uh, in respect of that, we have been asked to uh, reassess our original operational and financial plans to take account of additional monies to offset the deficits that we have accrued as a consequence of the industrial action, but also to reprioritise some of our operational activity to reflect a reduced expectation in regards to um, the amount of activity, elective activity delivered from um, 105% of our fund uh, uh, out to 203 percent, which is a, a, a reduction from the original expectation of 107 percent of activity when compared to outturns in the financial years 19, 20, which was pre-pandemic levels of activity. Um, and to reinforce the emphasis on uh, ensuring that we have resilient responses for uh, uh, what we anticipate uh, given recent, more recent levels of conversion and emergency activity mm -hmm. to be uh, a very challenging winter ahead. That has been a significant uh, amount of work for operational finance colleagues. We've been working over the last um, 48 hours to draw up uh, a new plan in response to those expectations. Our plan will go into a place-based plan at Bradford District and Craven. The District and Bradford District and Craven plan will go into a West Yorkshire-based plan. Uh, so there'll be an aggregation up of all of those with an expectation that um, it it uh, it be possible for us to meet our original financial plans um, uh, and uh, deal with the current and anticipated pressures. Of, uh, winter whilst maintaining as much activity, uh, activity as we possibly can. The colleague Saj uh, and his team, uh, uh, Matthew and his team, have been working on our return, which will require board sign off. It may not be ready for today, but we anticipate it will be ready for tomorrow, and therefore we'll be seeking later. Matthew will ask for delegated authority to sign off a submission to West Yorkshire um, tomorrow. Um, and that's all I want to say. I'd be happy to take questions on any of the report. Okay, so thank you very much. So um, in terms of that board sign off, um, in my other world, um, where I'm also a chair of the trust, um, there's been a discussion about the, the element of um, I guess flexibility we have over that, and because we're part of a big jigsaw, aren't we? There's the trust, the place, and then the ICB, and therefore fairly limited wriggle room, perhaps, in terms of what that how those need to add up. Um, I 
um, it's certainly has been agreed somewhere that I think that could be delegated to the chair um, and the chief executive to sign off. And I know I've got a meeting tomorrow in my other life with yeah. the chair, chief executive, and director of finance to sign that off. So I guess what I would probably be asking from you is whether or not we could have that same delegated authority for me to do that on the behalf of the board. Um, or whether you've got another way of doing well, it. My only other suggestion would be perhaps involve the um, chairman from chair yeah. the uh, bank chair yeah. from. Okay. Um, or uh, you know, or you may be content that actually Julie has the delegated authority working with uh, with Mel and Matthew to uh, to to sign that off because I'm comfortable with that too. Right. If others are, yeah. It's. I think it's going to be a bit of a like it's that the numbers seventy three. <laughs> whatever happens, I think that's how these processes work. We have to be realistic about that. Yep, people confirm yep. the Julie really can do that on, on our behalf as a board as chair of that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any questions of Mel on the content of her report? Yes, Mohammed. Uh, thanks, Alan. Just a couple of um, areas Mel to pick up on. I think you've talked about the financial kind of constraints or, or challenges. Um, it's been reported um in the media in general that the likely areas of kind of reallocation have been capital expenditure and it expenditure uh, and paul and i were having a chat just on the fringes of this meeting as well earlier uh, to try and understand whether that would also apply to us maybe it's too early to know um, but um, that's just one question the second bit of it is i think somewhere else in the bundle it talks about icb reorganization icb efficiency cutting um uh, kind of um headcount I'd be interested to know what the implications of that might be for us. I know some of our colleagues have joint roles. My worry would be that our then colleagues from here are being pulled more to support the ICB commitments that they may have because, uh, because that's being kind of squeezed. And then obviously that would have a downstream effect on us. And I'm concerned about that. Uh, your comments on that would be helpful. Um, and then the final piece was I welcome the comments you put in there about the international situation in Israel and Gaza. I think that was helpful. Um, I wanted to flag what I've seen elsewhere in other parts of the NHS, which has been perhaps a an approach that's not recognising solidarity with any aspect of, of the international conflict, and an approach that's almost been seen to um, take an overzealous approach around people expressing any type of solidarity at all. Um, and I just want to make sure that we don't get ourselves as a trust in, in that kind of position. And I often find that in these cases, it's best to perhaps communicate out as to what are, you know, what is, what are the parameters of expressing solidarity and, and it's perfectly reasonable solidarity, um, as opposed to then trying to rectify um, issues that may then have crossed, you know, appropriate boundaries. So I think it's perhaps something more positive about communications as to as to how to behave in this kind of difficult time. In terms of the finance capital, yeah, very happy. You, uh, no, 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 I'm very happy to yeah. answer those. Um, thank you. So, so you're quite right, uh, Mohammed. There is a, a, a suspicion that in order to fund uh, the 800 million, that that some pre-commitments made around uh, other expenditure uh, may be called into scrutiny, and they may be um, uh, more vulnerable. We haven't received any indication as yet uh, that anything that we are expecting in that regard is in that category. Um, clearly, when you embark upon commissioning contractors, you get so far up, up, up downstream that it's impossible without penalties and so on, and undesirable to um, reverse those decisions. And so you will see in the paper some of our flagship capital investments are proceeding uh, and we would expect that they will continue to do so until we're uh, or unless we're told otherwise. Um, on the operating model, um, uh, that is a piece of work that is ongoing. We're in the final throes of a public uh, uh, of a consultation, a public consultation, a consultation by those employed by West Yorkshire ICB. Um, to determine the appropriate structure. Uh, I've been working and leading very closely with colleagues, both at West Yorkshire and at Bradford District and um, Craven level, um, an operating model that we believe to be fit for purpose and able to be delivered, uh, and yet meeting the requirements to reduce our running costs by 30%. I'm pleased to say that 
the lion's share of that will have already been met by virtue of existing vacancies that have not been recruited to, and therefore the longer term impacts of the um, uh, removal of uh, some posts should not adversely affect um, either myself as place lead uh, or colleagues such as Karen, uh, who is already ensconced as a third of the chief nursing officer uh, role. Uh, other colleagues, of course, are very much involved, Saj in particular leading one of the work streams. But again, um, uh, Saj, you may want to comment that you've been involved in yeah. some of the discussions so that you can be assured that that will not adversely impact. Yeah. So we have a very regular access uh, to care work stream. We pull from a number of different sources. So colleagues genuinely working as one across our our place level. So all of our programs uh, remain intact and remain on, on course for delivery. But we, we meet very regularly, uh, both as an oversight group and actually the work stream as well. So the work's progressing and, and, and in line with where we expected it to be. And then on the, on the final point, uh, hopefully colleagues have seen the global emails that we have put out uh, around the support that we are making available for all of our colleagues, uh, whatever their thoughts or feelings, whatever their backgrounds, um, in a completely neutral and uh, non-judgmental way, we are here. Uh, for everyone, our neutrality in that regard is important. Uh, and uh, just yesterday, Fahim and I were chatting about, in response to some approaches that we have had from um, members of staff to say, could we do more uh, to offer through our staff networks uh, a space for safe conversations, supported by our Spark team, and supported by our occupational psychology team. So uh, the message is, uh, it is a very, very difficult time. We appreciate uh, that there will be disproportionate impacts on individuals relative to their own situation, but we are here for everybody. Okay, thank you for covering those points. I just think then, um, I was just trying to see if I could find it, but uh, whether or not the Ten, the risk, I guess, in terms of the changes the ICB impacting, whether they may not get themselves high enough up the risk score to feature on the high level risk stuff that will come here, but presumably you will be considering that within the review of any risk arrangement, you know, in our risk arrangements here, if that starts to impact, it may be worth plugging into it. We keep that under yeah. review. There is already um, an ongoing regular evaluation of the impact of Karen's role, for example, yeah. in respect of the uh, nursing uh, function, nursing and quality function uh, within the partnership, and that's due to report to the partnership leadership exec at the end of this round. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much. Any further questions on Nile's report? Yeah, um, I think um, just in terms of the, the situation in, in Gaza, um, some of the work the other trusts have done uh, been about resources. Um, around mental health and wellbeing, so I'll sample some of those to you. You can see, I think a number of trusts, obviously, up and down the country are, are grappling with how, how do we best support our teams around some of um, the feelings it might generate. And, it, and it, like you say, sometimes it's not just about people who are directly affected. Sometimes it's the impact of media coverage and the impact on healthcare yeah. professionals, etc. cetera. Um, the point really was around the um, listening exercises and, and it came as no surprise to see the access to GP services come up as one of the main things that's impacting on people in the district or one of the things that impact. Um, the paper mentioned that over 100 people are involved in thinking about collective solutions to that. Have we got um, colleagues involved in looking at some of the solutions? Because it feels like there's, there's um, an impact upstream, particularly in terms of um, E&D, for example. Um, so what work can we have? What input can we have in some of those conversations to look at solutions? Um, is that in respect to uh, in that, uh, access to GP services? Is, is that with a deliberate action and listening? So the deliberative sense? event um, was a, um, a, a culmination of all the individual listening events 
that have taken place across the district through the course of the last 12 months um, uh, that usually occur prior to a, a health and care partnership board. And because we've been running them for 12 months, we said, is this any good? People get out of it what they expect and want to get out of it. Do they feel listened to? And what are we going to do with the outputs from the, all of those conversations, of which some are very recurrent themes, GP practice uh, access is, is one. Um, and it was a, a, a really, really well attended and well engaged and participated with event. Um, we were represented, um, there were every sector in the room, there were really good conversations. Um, colleagues from primary care could explain what their approach was to improving access, but they could also, and did take the opportunity, I think, to share some evidence that suggests that the access to primary care is significantly better now than it was pre-pandemic. Some of that is not all face-to-face, -face, but equally not everybody wants face-to-face. -face. They'd rather have the access. So, so I think there was a, 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 good, um, a good story to tell about the fact, dispelling a few myths about whether or not it was better or worse, because it's, it evidently was better, but still the anxiety around GP access uh, and access per se, because we've heard about our own backlogs in collective care uh, exist. So we, we participate in, in, in those things. And similarly, through the access work stream, there is an awful lot of work on pathways and the use of digital GP assist in helping expedite those pathways. Um, colleagues who were at the um, AGM last night and the annual members meeting will have heard about the work that we're doing on uh, our virtual while infirmary, which is again is a different alternative offer uh, of how we can uh, provide better improved access to patients. So we're very definitely in that space. You might want yeah. to comment. I mean, I think I'll just pick up on the uh, assist pathways. We now have a hundred different specialty pathways on assist with over 30,000 regular hits now uh, on, that, uh, on that system. So what that allows um, the GPs to do, or in fact any primary care clinician to do, is to ensure that we navigate. As you can imagine the system is hugely complex to be able to navigate the patients to, uh, to the right place at uh, first time uh, in a desire and a hope that uh, we avoid uh, wastage and inefficiency. And some of the further developments that I've just been chatting with the virtual ward team about, and one component of the virtual ward is patient education, is to see if we couldn't link the patient education stuff that was being shared by Terry and colleagues yesterday into assist to make it a much more useful resource as well. So a lot of work in this space, but of course expectations, and quite rightly so, general public are, are, are high up as well. So I think there's something about expectations management and then there's something about generally the backlogs and how quickly we can get through the backlog so that those same patients that are on existing waiting times aren't re looping to the service because that will add pressure to uh, to to the system okay thank you very much that's uh, really helpful um let's uh, let's move on now i had a real nice smile to myself when i saw the words logic model in these papers <laughs> so when i was in rapid before everything it, it moved it as a logic model attached to it and so it, it did make me smile when i saw oh welcome back to rapid logic models here they are <laughs> so mel this yes. is your paper uh, it is thank you um this is a paper that would ordinarily be delivered by our director of strategy and as we don't have one currently uh, i'm the standing that on. yeah i'm taking this one uh, as well um, so colleagues will be familiar and well, it, within the suite of papers you will see just as a, a little reminder the plan on a page which represents our um, uh, our strategy as an organisation and our previous agreements that um, in uh, relation to our four P's, patients, people, place and partners, we would bring back a little bit more detail from time to time uh, to this board so that we could take a view on whether or not our uh, ambitions were 
progressing and we were able to demonstrate that we were making uh, progress. So this is, um, uh, as part of the suite, is a brief description of how the work is being delivered. Um, it, it draws on the experiences and the leadership of each of the lead executives relative to the subject matter uh, within the uh, logic model. Um, it, it, it also reinforces some of the reporting that we agreed would also go through each of our academies so that we could cross-reference. So there's a really, uh, I much prefer the narrative. I like the words more than the, 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 the very complex matrix there that demonstrates where each of the logic items in the logic model reports to um, in our academy uh, framework. Um, uh, just for clarity, if you see a green, uh, in the RAG rating, it doesn't mean that it's done and dusted. What it means is that we are making what we believe is sig significant or appropriate progress towards the achievement. Um, you'll remember our discussions and debates previously as a board that, that if we were reporting green at this stage of uh, year one of a five-year strategy, it, it wasn't probably a strategy, it was more an operational plan. So, so the greens and the ambers uh, reflect uh, the progress to varying degrees, some better than others, uh, but pleasingly no uh, red uh, uh, ratings within that logic model. Um, I'm able to assist by my exact colleagues in the completion of this, so uh, happy to take questions, chair, and redirect them to others who may be better placed mm -hmm. to respond. You might, you might prefer the words. I like the picture, so I love the picture. I love oh, the patients. Oh, I was talking about this. Yeah, that's done. Uh, well, yeah, I, I didn't. I just got yeah, yeah, drowned. But I'm totally getting a drowned. This one, and then what? What I tend to do in my brain is I think. So we've heard Sarah directly with me today, and I think strategy. People, new ways of working, growing for the future, and and I hear from her presentation how we are progressing with our strategy. I find that, personally, I find that easier mm -hmm. than, a, than a sort of thing. And I tend to then use that, and I'll do the same with the digital strategy. I think, ah, yeah, connection. So I think for me, a strategy has to feel alive. It has to feel like something that's directing and informing the work that we do. And so far, through this meeting, I've heard that. You know, and I think that's really encouraging to me, because uh, you know, if it, if it just feels like something on a bit of a paper or something with a chart or something with a, a green or red blob against it, it doesn't necessarily, I think, bring it to life. So, you know, I, I, thought, I thought it was a lovely depiction. Well, Chair, if, you, if we were having this meeting in our boardroom stroke conference room, yeah. that's on the wall so yeah, that we can do that in room. the moment. Right. So, to the next time, then. in the room. Okay, so happy to take any comments and questions. I've got Barry and then Julie. And Mel, I take on board your point about the, the RAG rating being a, a, a progress indicator rather than pointing to the, 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 the final solution. Uh, for me, reading this, it's very useful to be able to see the progress that's being made across the piece in terms of strategy. I think where a, 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 an amber button appears, it raises the question for me, well, why is it amber? What are we doing about it? How do we get, get back to green again? Uh, I'm reluctant to make this document any bigger, but from a, a non-executive point of view, looking in on this, I just find that explanation helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So rather than conscious that we could go through each of those, I could draw on colleagues' experience. If if it's helpful, as an after board note, where there is an amber, um, I'll ask for an a, an additional piece of information to share with colleagues explaining what it would take for that to be changed okay. to agree. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Happy with that, yeah. My comment was similar to Barry. Okay. The only other thing to suggest was we've got the key on. So I looked at it first and without the key thought, this yes. is a bit green and rosy. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. Linked to some of the other conversations and some of the challenges, so if we could just put the key on as well. Yes. I think the RAG rating of any strategy is always challenging with yeah. the RAG rating your uh, have you delivered the things you set out to do, not the outcome you were seeking to achieve? Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. always a tension, isn't it? Um, um, I was just going to make one really simple and yeah. obvious point, Helen, if you don't mind, and that is that that strategy picture, the visual, uh, and the people element of that 
um, is really aligned to place in terms of strategy. So we talked about ICB and, and Bradford and district and Craven Place, but actually what's happening in Bradford is really aligned to what's happening in place. Yeah. But I know it's obvious, but actually it's really relevant. It's a really good point. Um, Hannah? Um, yeah, just to follow on with Bill those comments, really. I think there's something here about recognising journey we've been on in the last year in the context of where we are today versus when this was originally proposed and written. Um, so we talked earlier, Chair, about, um, and we'll have a discussion in our closed session around an action plan and development and learning, I mean, a learning organisation. Um, we talked this morning for the open meeting around culture versus strategy. So I think there's something here for us to think about, perhaps for you, Faye, I think, around what are we going to be, the learning we're going to take uh, in terms of our action plan and the learning we've already accrued over the last few months. How do we make sure we build that into this strategy around culture? Sure. Um, so because you know, we've, we've, there's something about, it's something written down, you know, an espoused value, an espoused strategy, an espoused culture it isn't lived value, lived strategy, lived culture. Uh, and there's something about that. And I think in some ways we've had a really good opportunity to get up and close with our own cultures and our own values. And I want to make sure we're drawing some kind of connection back into this. And looking, it may be that we look at all of this and think it, nothing is changing. It's still on the right track. We don't need to enhance it in any way. It may be that we look at this in, in, in reflection and think, actually, there are some things we could do to enhance this a little bit more um, and to make sure that espoused values are lived values. It's a lived culture um, and just a, something for you to think about. <laughs> Okay, so I, I guess I would encourage everybody to think about that as opposed to a nurse local Spain. I don't no, think he's the sole guardian of culture, is he? I think, I, you know, I think we all are. Um, and I think there's something, I think you make a really good point, particularly about continually revisiting a strategy. Um, because if it remains static, it's not mm. right, because it should continually evolve and change to the environment that we're operating in. And the plan of the page might look the same because it's got the same headings in. But, um, you know, I think the NHS is notorious for doing a strategy, there it is, and then we'll carry on doing over here. Whereas the strategy should live, it should change, it should adapt, it should evolve. So I think you're making that point in current circumstances, but I think I think it's a generally well-made point. Um, I just wanted to pick up on Mohammed's point, actually, and um, I think this is work done through the academies and back to the light governance model that we talked about in February, um, we do see that operationally, those action plans that sit there feeding up, up to where we're heading. So strategic vision, um, you know, everything that we talk about in certain the People Academy and I can talk for FNP and not a QPSA, that there should always, whilst it's not that strategic plan, not about day-to-day, day-to-day activity should be aligned to Again, like North Star. So um, I think what we see through the academy, we can influence in terms of that evolution um, and, and should, absolutely. So you, you, your strategy won't change, your vision won't change, but the action you take underneath there. And I think like that's where that activity should take place, not necessarily in this strategy document itself, but we can we can influence that through our academies. So you and I are probably on slightly different pages there, but that's okay. We can be on just slightly different pages. Same. I think just the other thing I think I should highlight is that we've, we're undertaking the NHS England uh, Cultural Leadership Programme. And as part of that, I think it's really important to measure the culture within the organisation, not necessarily just in terms of what we see as culture uh, as, as the board. So, as part of that programme, we've got a working group from a cross section of staff um, and that will measure what culture is like across the organisation, how it feels for staff within the organisation, not just for us as a board. And I think that will help us help inform sort of our steps forward in terms of that cultural piece for as an organisation. So we're part of a, um, a pro programme that we've been embarked upon. And that, I think, is a really crucial piece of work for us from a cultural perspective. I really welcome that, Faye, and I think that's the right approach. I think there's something else about recognising there's not one culture. Uh, you know, there are lots of subcultures and, and there's a lot of berry, but which is all good. 
but we need to make sure that everyone's trending in the same direction. Everyone's got the Northern Star, as, as Karen kind of referenced it. Um, and there's something about just always checking ourselves. Culture changes and evolves, and when you put it under pressure, uh, people's behaviours can can change. When they're under pressure, and something we we got out from lots of you know NHS reports in the past around people's focus perhaps on delivery or something else, you know, can mean that culture trends in adverse directions and people don't spot it because you're too close. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we've got sorry, Helen, we've we've got around thirty staff. I think involved in a uh, a working group from across the organisation in terms of that cultural piece and it will give us hopefully give us that understanding of the microculture that you get within the organisation and are we heading in the same direction as where we as a board think we are taking the organisation and, and we want the organisation to go uh, and that will help us help inform some of our uh, sort of future planning in terms of culture. The cultures will always be different, won't they? The values will not uh, are the things that do not change. The values are the things that you know hold us firm in terms of the way we respond. I think um, I think we could debate forever. Is a strategy a vision? Is it the what? Is it the how? Is it the? But essentially, you know, from a board's perspective, this is in, you know this is like our, this is our guides, isn't it? This is what. So you know, are we delivering against our strategy? Are we delivering against our our wider vision now, you know, I, I don't know the work we've done together today, to and we don't no doubt that we'll look at this at some point during some of the board development work. But uh, as, a, as a sort of, I guess, as a as a work, continued work in progress, and um, with that additional um, input from Mel around just giving people the update on the ambers and what needs to do to, to, in terms of that, something to bring, um, are people sort of content to and I have to work out what it is that has to do with it. Just hang on a minute. Mm -hmm. to just review it. We've had a review. We've had a conversation. Note it. For now. People are happy to move on? Okay. So I'm going to move on to digital strategy. Thanks. In our annual report. Over uh, to Paul. Thanks, Chair. And again, I'm uh, the working assumption that the board colleague have, have read the document. Um, I'm slightly anxious given time in my. Uh, Nature that I've got more speaking notes here than might be the length of the actual document, but they'll circulate it to you. So I apologize in advance for that. But um, it, it, it was, I'm living my culture. Uh, but so the intention is just to focus in on some some key achievements in in uh, in the past year. Um, again, apologies in advance. I noticed at AGM last night that we had a little sprinkling of acronyms across the documents for many of crept through the last the last review. I apologize. Um, and again, just for visibility, um, you will hear. I mean, we've already heard from from Sarah this morning about the importance and criticality of the, the data in, in her portfolio. You will hear when Judith comes about the work in the context of the improvement strategy, um, that the interweaving of a lot of digital data insight and intelligence and other key documents. Um, I just wanted to pull out a couple of bits, really. One, the focus on the insights work, so it actually comes towards the back of the document, but we've been hampered historically by having a real challenge around. We, we appear to be generating all of this really important data, capturing all this data, but actually rendering it back in a meaningful fashion to so the organization has been a has been a challenge. I think we've absolutely turned the corner in relation to that. And the Insight Center is giving uh, frontline colleagues and uh, a real opportunity to uh, using the making data count principles, create conversations for their leadership team on the basis of what is actually going on in relation to finances, in relation to quality, in relation to HR, in relation to to things not just in a in a singular through a singular perspective, but actually the triangulation of all of those elements, which I think is fundamentally uh, important. Um, I, I would acknowledge that the team itself is being challenged to get up to speed. So um, they were used to tooling in one set of disciplines. They're now uh, uh, becoming equipped to use Power BI more effectively. Um, and that we're just about to push to a sort of advertisement, promotion, education and training piece across the whole organization in relation to how to use um, these new data quality tools more effectively. And we're continuing to recognize that the data we've got is only as good as the data that's captured at source. So working with colleagues to ensure that we maintain a high level of data quality. 
Um, a lot of the other work um, speaks to uh, the sort of myriad of partnerships. And so a lot of work is probably in train. So a lot of our EPR work is currently related to the plan go live with the same article sooner EPR in the acute environment in Airdale in, 20, in September of 2024. That's a partnership which colleagues will know historically has been Bradford Teaching Hospital working with Collidale and Huddersfield. We're now extending that partnership to include Airedale. Um, we're, adopt, we're using a, um, adopt an ADAPT model that's also creating some opportunities for Bradford colleagues to reflect on their practice and see if there's anything that can be improved or changed. Um, and we are explicitly deploying the theatre's anesthesia and critical care module with, uh, within Cerner to add that to our, our suite, um, recognising that the impact and implication of operational service pressures of them, and I mean that getting colleagues released to help design that is, is a little bit of a challenge, but, <clears throat> but we're making progress. And again, reflecting on the presentation last night at the annual members meeting, the annual general meeting, um, uh, the virtual Royal infirmary work while being led absolutely appropriately through carrying colleagues and ops um, is again something that is a whole organizational endeavor and a lot of my colleagues in my team and uh, others are working in that context. Um, uh, I mean, the only other thing I wanted to really say is that um, we've included one slide about how we intend to work differently going forward, because I think um, I feel like we are responsible for a common set of assets and resources across the organization in terms of words like cybersecurity, information governance, exciting developments in edge and Wi-Fi infrastructure. Um, but actually, much of the rest of our work is about CSU by CSU, business objective by business objective and being clear about supporting uh, operational colleagues in their ambitions to produce and deliver higher quality care. So there is one slide in there, which is a reboot um, in light of, uh, helpfully, um, a deputy coming into to my senior leadership team that hasn't been there before. Um, and then my last reflection, again, we have noted this in the past, but I think because it is still in this year, um, uh, and just recognizing sort of the challenges of attending a holistic leadership um, is that the team has still really from the loss of also when it, uh, as a CCI. Um, we've done a lot of work. Um, I think we've also had the benefit of being in person again because managing some of that when you can only manage that through the medium of teams isn't really affected. So we're we're back in person in a number of key ways. Um, and also we've added to the team of business manager who's got a strong background in, in HR and that and that's also helpful in terms of the team's general sense of health and well-being. Um, so uh, again, uh, open to, to questions consequent, but um, it's been a difficult year, um, uh, uh, but an important year, I think, still in, in making the impact that we want to make uh, in supporting the organization's wider objectives and those objectives of partners. So, well, thank you very much for that report. It's hard to imagine this becomes a bit of a sideshow right? when you think now that it's uh, integral to absolutely everything that we do. And um, there is, you know, the conversations we've had today are, are so much, you know, enhanced through the way we support digitally, um, whether it's through data, intelligence, information, kit, whatever it's, whatever it is. And um, we couldn't function now without, um, without this level of ambition. Either I think in terms of being able to push ourselves forward, um, and you know what I read from this as I look at it is that is that level of ambition. So thank you for that report, and I shall open it up for any questions. Um, Hannah, this is your really awesome area. So one, one of my questions. Hobby horses, and <laughs> um, um, uh, just because I worked in Syria for, for uh, quite a number of don't, years. Don't um, talk technical. No, 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 I'm not. Don't worry. Uh, no danger of that. <laughs> Um, uh, Paul, thank you for this. It's really helpful. And obviously, we've seen this before. I think you came to QPSA, uh, and so it's really helpful. Uh, just a couple of observations and, and one point, perhaps. Um, observations, I think, in terms of Microsoft 365 migration, that's a really big thing to do. And the trust has done that uh, remarkably well. And I'm sure it's made everyone's life easier. It's really made my life easier than Ed. Um, so I think that, that's been fantastic. And just the flexibility it then gives us as a trust. Uh, to support our, our staff, I think is, is, is really great. So I'm really pleased about that. 
Um, there's lots of really good stuff in here, and I think we're getting into a cadence and a rhythm of being able to share our priorities, kind of the digital priorities with the QPSA, so we can see the backlog and we can see what the priorities are. Every part of the trust, every CSU, every clinical team has demands on you. Um, everybody wants you to fix something. Everyone needs you to, to do something. But there has to be a recognition, as I think you and I have already agreed or previously, that digital in its own is just a black box that does something there. Sometimes you need training, you need work, you know, workforce changes uh, and business changes to support that. And, and I think there's a recognition of that. Um, just a couple of points then in terms of um, what um, oh, the VRI steps, absolutely fantastic and really impressive. So, so thank you for all the work you've done on that. Uh, there's a little typo. I just wanted to, do, I wanted to fix it up, fix it for you now. So that I know this is good collateral and you might want to reuse it. Just on the um, key achievements on slide four, it talks about the ominous old medicines cabinet. And I think you mean prescribing rather than dispensing. Um, so it just needs a type of fixing. Um, can I draw something from the part of the agenda? I'm, I've been working on something which is around trying, to, as a NED, trying to draw together bits that I'm picking up somewhere else into another area, perhaps that is perhaps not such an obvious connection, but is an important one. Something that Ray and I talked about um, at um, QPSA has been around depth of coding, uh, clinical informatics, and something that came up it's in the chair's report and came up in our last QPFA uh, meeting this month, was around, I think I'm not misquoting you, Ray, but I think it was with second poorest in terms of our depth of coding, in terms of quality in the country. And that's a position we found ourselves in over a period of time. What is the way we try and fix that? There's obviously an interface between clinical and clinical informatics here. Uh, how are we going to address that? Because that is a really important piece uh, that we need to try and improve on it has lots of downstream effects elsewhere um maybe you can talk to talk to that i don't know whether you yourself or ray that's an area that i found that you know i think feels like a priority area for us it's in both your areas how do we bring that together and how do we focus on that depth of coding issue yeah i mean I, I, yeah i mean there's probably a couple of aspects to that i mean there's i think we're seven years into a relationship with a product that um, I keep using the word renaissance and then thinking that's not really going to sure. help people. But I think we're in a position where we should now be saying, um, have we achieved what we intended to achieve in this organization by committing as uh, convincingly as we did to the deployment of what is now the Oracle Center Milan? Um, and if not, where are the opportunities to improve that? And one of the things that I think is represents a challenge to colleagues is their relationship, whether it's the education and training component, whether it's the um, the extent to which that that feels like they've got a set of responsibilities that relate not just to a patient in front of them, but to all of the consequential implications of that in relation to data that and therefore I'm joking that, that you're referring to. I mean Barry may have a comment because I mean I I, um, I am kept on my metal and will be again at the next audit committee about the program of work in relation to to data to data quality and um, i think some of it looks back to my earlier point about mm -hmm. the black box I and mean, then in essence because we had problems with data warehousing it was too easy to say this isn't a whole team endeavor it was too easy to go well we're not getting anything back so why should we as committed as we are um so i am happy to suggest Mama, that we will have a focus and are some way down a focus program of work to improve the depth the quality of that that coding and that that will involve mm -hmm. educational interventions it will involve the whole understanding of this insights opportunity etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and, uh, and a paper to that effect or work to that effect and will flow through in the in the next year business plan Okay, so, and Barry, Ray, do you want to add to this? Yeah, just to add, add a bit of uh, a bit more to what Mohammed asked. So you, you have this close to me. I think that's we are second uh, worst for depth of coding in England. And um, just for those who, who perhaps don't know what that means, um, coding is, is really important um, for many things. We have to understand the work that we're doing. Um, it's also important for some community cases, which are very public and very visible, and probably the most notable being Shimmy, so summary hospital mortality indicator. Um, and that gives an indication of uh, not whether we have avoidable deaths, 
but how many deaths we have um, in relation to what would be expected given England's average for a particular disease category. Um, and depth of coding really influences that. Uh, there is a primary diagnosis and then there are a number of secondary diagnoses. So the primary diagnosis, uh, I think there's, there's 150 different diagnoses categories that you could uh, be in there. Um, and the secondary diagnoses, it can be up to 19 different lines of coding that you can add to give a bit more of a, a picture about the individual who has died to understand perhaps that person has a much higher risk and therefore their death was perhaps more likely for any given intervention that they might have had. Um, so average depth of coding across the country, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's, it's about six and a half, something like that, lines of coding for the secondary codes. Uh, the best hospitals um, achieve double figures, so it gets about 10, 11, de uh, 10, 11 lines of coding. We're currently running about 2.6 on average. Um, so, uh, and, it, it, and it's no coincidence that if you look on the, the positive outliers or the hospitals which have less than expected numbers of deaths, the uh, London hospitals are massively overrepresented and they're the ones that do coding the best. Um, so um, our depth of coding is, is a long way from, from where it needs to be. So I suppose the challenge then is, so why is that and, and what can we do about it? I think um, we particularly should do better because we've had um, CERNA uh, electronic patient record now for a few years. Uh, it really gives us a, not a unique opportunity, but an opportunity not open to everybody to understand really what's going on with our patients when, you, when they come in. We're not taking advantage of that. Uh, there have been um, uh, issues, I suppose, staffing issues within the coding department. I think the clinical input and coding is really important, um, and that's probably been a little bit uh, lacking. I think the clinicians who understand EPR probably need to uh, have some um, guidance, instruction, coaching as to how they can use EPR better um, so that they can make it easier for the coders to actually extract the information that we need. I think it probably comes back a little bit to, you know, EPR, there's, there's a lot of work done um, in uh, when EPR was, was implemented. And I think we all acknowledge probably with, with the excitement of that, actually a lot of the uh, uh, guidance and instruction on use of EPR is better probably after you've used it for a while rather than before you've used it because you don't really know what you don't know. Now would be a really good time, I think, to, to refresh that understanding of clinicians about how they can use it to help themselves, help the patients, but also help, help the organisation. Um, so Mike McCoo, who's one of our Associate Medical Directors for Learning and Dance, um, he um, uh, is uh, working with the coding department at the moment to try and understand what that clinical um, what that clinical offering and, and assistance might look like, both in terms of how we enter information into EPR, but also how the code is extracted from EPR. Um, so that's that's a, a, a sort of information gathering piece, and then we need to try and understand um, what then we need to do to try and fix it. Okay. Anything else about that? You obviously looked at it through all day. Um, I wasn't going to comment any further on, on okay. the base quality point. Okay. Well, we, you've got we, we continue to okay. get uh, uh, good updates from, from Paul. No, it's just whilst we're in the digital space, yeah. apologies if I've missed something, but it seems some time now since I've seen a, a progress report on command centre. Okay. We, we looked at that, we looked at the benefits we were seeking, justification for the expenditure and investment in command centre. Uh, I just wonder if, if, if the time, if we, we agree the time is now right for a, a further update as to where Command Centre is up to. Is it delivering the benefits that we expected? Where does it go to from here? Okay, so I'll, I'll let that just... Mm. I was, uh, I think between yeah. Paul and I, I'm sure we can pull something uh, together in terms of uh, bringing something back. Uh, whether we bring it here or into one of the academies, quite happy to, uh, quite happy to okay. do that. Okay, thank you. So just in the interest of time, it seems like people generally sort of know, appreciate, value, 
our level of digital ambition. But there's obviously an issue around data quality and coding. And without good quality, then everything else is rubbish, isn't it? Really, um, to some to some degree. So I guess what I think we probably need visibility on is that sort of what is that high level action plan? What are we doing? By when? And when do we expect to see improvement? So it sounds like there's bits of work going on. But I think if you could maybe draw that together into some sort of, and I don't think we want thread to the needle. Um, Mahmoud might, she understands it, but I don't think everybody else would. Um, you know, we just need to know what are we doing? When we're going to finish it by? And when will we see some improvement? Because being second from the bottom or whatever isn't a great place to be. It'd be good to see when we're going to be 10 from the bottom or when we're going to be 20 from the bottom and when will we see that progress. And, and then perhaps what, we need to do collectively to put a bit of oomph behind that if it's dragging around a bit and it's sort of not quite quite right landing. Would that be a, a reasonable ask of you? In time. Oh, okay. So if we could maybe get that in the minutes as a specific, I think, in terms of a uh, specific action. And then in terms of the rest of it, thank you, comprehensive report. And, um, you know, and I guess what, regardless of that, I think, this organisation is still well up there, isn't it, in yeah. terms of its sort of digital capability. Right, I'm miles off my agenda planning time now, as you can see. I'm sure everybody's a bit hungry. So can I suggest we stop at this point for a quick comfort break and a bit of lunch, try and do it as quickly as we can. Um, I know we've, got, we've only got half an hour in the first place, but uh, if we could maybe try and... Yeah, let's, let's take the half, let's take 25 minutes. Let's get back in here for one o'clock um, and then we'll then 